Welcome back guys. This is going to be a brand new series on nonlinear dynamics. In the previous series, we talked about how we can visualize differential equations by viewing them as a particle in a fluid like this. In particular, we talked about something called linearization, which is an extremely powerful method for predicting motion near a point. While this theory is very useful and is the foundation of nonlinear dynamics, it could not answer all of our questions. One of the questions we were left with was, what is the significance of a closed orbit like this one, and how can we predict and understand it? In this first video of this series, we're going to begin to answer this question by looking at something called index theory. So let's get started. Let's begin by thinking about the physical significance of a closed orbit by considering our good old spring mass system again. As you can see, the trajectory of our particle in this case will always be a closed orbit in phase space. And since in physical systems we typically plot velocity of the mass on the y-axis and displacement of the mass on the x-axis, that means that closed orbits typically correspond to some type of oscillation of our physical system. And this is really important because lots of real-world phenomena exhibit oscillatory behavior, like the beating of a heart, or wind-induced vibration of a cylinder known as galloping or simple predator versus prey population models, or even the mechanics behind cell division. All of these phenomena can be modeled with nonlinear differential equations. And somewhere hidden behind these equations is the key to understanding their potentially very complicated oscillatory behavior. So let's get started. Let's consider the phase plane of this nonlinear differential equation I'm showing here. Let's plot the trajectory of this particle numerically with an initial condition of x is equal to 2, y is equal to 0. And as you can see, we have a closed orbit. Now this is where it gets interesting. At some point along this curve, I'm going to draw an arrow in the direction of the vector field. Then I'm going to choose to trace this point around our curve like this, making sure that at each point the arrow is in the direction of the vector field. And by the time we get to the end, the arrow will have rotated one full counterclockwise rotation. Didn't see it? Let me show you again while visualizing the arrow by itself here. Notice that because the arrow is tangent to the closed curve, it does exactly one counterclockwise rotation. Now let's consider the famous van der Poel equation and its periodic orbit once again. If we decide to sweep this yellow dot around the curve like this, keeping the arrow in the direction of the vector field, just like we did before, we also notice that the arrow does one counterclockwise rotation. It turns out this isn't a property specific to these closed orbits, by the way. This is a property of all closed orbits. And if we define the index, i, as the number of complete counterclockwise rotations that have been made, then we can say that the index of all closed orbits is equal to plus one. Now my question to you is this, how can we use the fact that all closed orbits have exactly one counterclockwise rotation to understand them more? Well, let's think more generally. Let's consider a new vector field. In this case, it's got an unstable node, the origin. And let's consider any simple closed curve not necessarily a closed orbit, and do the same thing as before. Just to be clear, this circle is not a trajectory. It's just an arbitrary closed curve I've drawn. If we draw our arrow again and keep track of its rotation as the arrow moves in the direction of the vector field, we'll notice that it also swoops out exactly one counterclockwise rotation. Crazy, right? So in this case, the index of this curve in this vector field is plus one. Now let's do the same with another vector field given by this equation. As you can see, the vector field is constant and points in one direction. So that means the index is equal to zero. Interesting, so that means they're not all plus one. Let's try again with another vector field shown here, corresponding to a single stable spiral fixed point. 
In this case, the vector field still results in one full counterclockwise rotation, so its index is equal to plus one. Now finally, let's consider a vector field corresponding to a saddle fixed point. And notice that for the first time, we get a clockwise rotation. That means its index is equal to minus one. But let's not stop here. Rather than a circle, let's consider a more interesting simple closed curve. Notice that with this shape, the index is still minus one. And even with this shape, the index is still minus one. And the same is true of this shape too. So what's going on here? Why are all the indices integers? And why do they all seem to be independent of the shape of the curve we choose? Perhaps by figuring out what's going on here, we can learn more about periodic orbits. So let's define what I'm talking about here. The arrow at some instant will have an angle with the horizontal that I'll call phi. And this angle here is determined from the vector field at that point. Remember, the horizontal component of the vector field is x dot, and the vertical component of the vector field is y dot. And in the general case, x dot is equal to some function, f of x, y, and y dot is equal to some other function, g of x, y. And so that means that phi is equal to arctan of g of x, y divided by f of x, y. And so now we're ready to relate this value of phi to the index. Okay, so we know that phi is equal to arctan of g on f. And we previously defined index as the number of counterclockwise revolutions of our arrow. And so that means that the index of some curve in some vector field is just the net change in phi over one circuit divided by two pi. This is because one revolution of our arrow is equal to two pi radians. And I won't prove it here, but by massaging these two formulas together, you can prove that index is equal to one divided by two pi times the closed integral of f dg minus gdf, all divided by f squared plus g squared. And already from this formula, we can see that there are some special cases where the index is undefined. If at any point f of x, y, and g of x, y are both zero simultaneously, then we'll be dividing by zero in this expression. Now recall that a fixed point is defined to be the point x star y star, where f and g are both zero. This means that if our closed curve passes through a fixed point, then our index is undefined. This makes sense graphically too. I mean, if our curve passes through a fixed point, then what direction would the arrow be at that point? It's undefined. Okay, now we can ask another question. Why does every index appear to be an integer? Well, notice that the starting phi value must always equal the ending phi value because they share the same vector field at that point. This means there can't be a fractional amount of rotations, and that means that the index must always be some positive or negative integer, as long as it doesn't pass through a fixed point. This helps answer our other question. Why does the index appear to remain unchanged even when deforming the shape of the closed curve? Well, let's put the deformation of the curve versus the index i. Now, what do I mean by deformation? Well, each point on the curve, let's call it x1, y1, can be transformed nice and continuously from some start position to some end position I'll call x2, y2 by varying some parameter, which I'll call t, using an equation like this. Now, in case you're interested, this value t is called a homotopy parameter, and you can look that up if you're interested. Now, because we're dealing with a simple closed curve in a smoothly changing vector field, and because we're dealing with continuous deformations, you might be tempted to think that the graph could look like any smooth continuous curve, like this. However, this is wrong because it implies there are non-integer indexes. And so the only way a smooth continuous curve can exist that also must be an integer 
is if the index remains perfectly constant. And so this proves what we showed before. The index does not change with the shape of the curve C, as long as the curve doesn't pass through a fixed point. So this means we can do away with talking about the index of a specific curve, and instead talk about the index associated with specific fixed points. It turns out that saddles will always produce an index of minus 1, and it turns out that literally all other fixed points, stable or unstable nodes, or stable or unstable spirals, or nonlinear centers, will produce an index of plus 1. And if the curve doesn't eclipse a fixed point at all, then the index will be exactly 0. But this just begs the question, what if the curve surrounds multiple fixed points? Here I've got three fixed points inside this curve, a center plus one, a saddle minus one, and a center plus one. Well, we know that we can shrink our curve down like this without changing the index. And so what's the index of this tightly fitting curve? Well, let's think about this systematically. I'll call the net change in angle of this upper part of this bridge delta phi one and I'll call the net change of angle of the upper part of this bridge delta phi 2. Now in the limit, as we shrink the width of this bridge to 0, they will share the same vector field. And so the change in angle of this bottom part here will be minus delta phi 2, and the change in this part will be minus delta phi 1. And so what's the index of the whole curve? Well, it'll be plus 1 for the center, minus 1 for the saddle, plus one for the other center, plus the sum of all the bridge components divided by two pi. And since these bridge components will cancel out perfectly, the index of our curve is just plus one. And the beauty of this method is that it can be generalized to apply to any curve, which means that amazingly, the index of any curve, C, is equal to the sum of the indices of the fixed points inside that curve, where I subscript K here is the index of the kth fixed point inside the curve. And so now we have all the ingredients we need to learn about closed orbits. Remember, we showed earlier that the index of any closed orbit must be plus one. Putting these two bits of information together, we can say for sure that every closed orbit must have fixed points inside of it that have indices that all sum to plus one. And you can see that in this example. This periodic solution surrounds three fixed points. A center here, plus one, a saddle here, minus one, and a center here plus one. If we sum them up, one minus one plus one is equal to one. Hey, it works. We can also see numerically that closed orbits exist here and here. Notice that the net sum for each of these curves are also plus one. Yep, it works. Now I should clarify one downside. This rule states that all closed orbits have a net index of plus 1, but that doesn't mean that all curves that have a net index of plus 1 is a closed orbit. In other words, the real power of this method comes from ruling out closed orbits. And we can see that here. Note that it's genuinely impossible for any closed orbit to exist that surrounds just this saddle and center. This is because their indices sum to zero and not plus one. We know it's impossible for a closed orbit to exist anywhere inside this region. And there we have it. We have some global information about our nonlinear differential equation with regards to the existence of periodic solutions. But how can we know more precisely what our periodic solution is and how can we characterize it? Well, we'll talk more about that in the next video. Cheers.